I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Welcome to the Playing FTSE podcast. My name's Paul and each episode, me and the lads get together to talk about the stocks, stock market news and finance in general. Quick disclaimer, you shouldn't consider anything in this podcast as personal financial advice. If you need such advice, go to a financial advisor. And please remember when investing in any form, your capital is at risk. So sit back, relax, and let the lads fill you in with all the stock market news of the week. The sucker's going up. Welcome everyone to the Midweek FTSE Show. I'm here with Steve D. Just us two this time. Paul's uh, still not well, unfortunately. We're hoping he'll be back with us soon. But in the meantime, we've got a question. Uh, we like to formalise these around uh, the questions that you guys ask. So uh, this time a user called Plus Aerobic. Uh, nice name, Plus Aerobic. Uh, right. Hi, guys. What do you think of the Fed banning lawmakers from owning stocks? What do you think? Uh, should they do the same in the UK? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, so we like thinking about some of these kind of macro issues and how they relate to kind of broad policy based um, concerns as well. So uh, this is around a story that there's a bipartisan bill out in the Senate, I think, um, that's supposed to prevent lawmakers and senior staffers, for that matter, from basically using information that they have that should be confidential or classified and not publicly available and might move markets effectively. So it covers um, buying and selling of certain kinds of stocks, most options and pretty much all bonds as well, I think. Uh, so... What the idea is, is that if you're, say, the uh, chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee and you've been receiving confidential briefings from certain companies, or if you've been in a government meeting where you're deciding about whether or not to lock the country down, you shouldn't be able to use that money to then go and uh, make trades that will obviously be profitable as the news that's been made available to you comes out into the public domain, effectively. It doesn't prevent, in the way that it's worded, uh lawmakers from owning stocks they can still own them in various ways they can own them in pension structures um they can put their assets into blind trusts uh which can contain stocks so they're allowed to own them still what they're not allowed to do is use information that they have in virtue of their position to make trades that wouldn't be kind of uh based on information available to the public i think so what do you think about this idea steve on the right lines um, yeah, it has to be on the right lines, doesn't it? I think there is um, there there is definitely an ethical concern between somebody who goes into a war cabinet meeting and comes out for it and buys shares of Lockheed Martin. I think that's just, I think we can all agree that that's not fair. That is, that has got to be the textbook definition of insider trading, almost, hasn't it? So, um, I don't think there's a, a particularly, I don't think anybody would have a particular issue with the broader part of this policy. Whether it actually covers enough stuff is. Um, is a different is a different query entirely. Um, am I in favour of it? Yeah, I guess so. I guess I have to be. Um, what about you, Steve? Are you, are you in favour? Would you would you put it through if you're on the other side of the Senate? I think I probably would, uh, depending on, as you rightly said, how the details on this shake out. Uh, I think so. It's interesting that this isn't covered by kind of existing provisions to prevent insider trading, uh, because it seems pretty much like the kind of thing that ought to be covered. So an expansion to include mm. that is. At least in theory, a good idea. Uh, in theory, good in practice might be harder to implement. Um, uh, so Plus's question was whether or not we would implement this in the UK or whether we would bring this over here. And of course, there's been an interesting uh, couple of stories during the kind of pandemic about uh, Matt Hancock, uh, who was the then health secretary, um, finding himself with, uh, as an owner of Glaxo shares, I think, um, and their involvement in kind mm. of pandemic provisions and contracts they were picking up. There's also been kind of broader questions around contracts being given to companies that were entirely unsuitable for them. Feel like we have a similar -ish sort of issue to deal with on this side of the pond? I think we do, yeah. I think um, I think we've probably got a little bit more corruption thrown into the pool as well, just for a little bit of extra added spice. Um, I'm not entirely sure i've ever seen um any of our government's um portfolios i'm, I'm not even sure if they're I, I'm, I'm assuming they go through some kind of ethics committee before they're allowed to buy and what have you but i'm not sure that's actually made public like the um like the um the u.s one is um but yeah maybe some u.s style transparency into exactly what people are buying would have a uk version of whale wisdom um that might be quite interesting to see um i think they're probably the 
the long and short of it is I always suspect that the UK is a lot more interested in mutual funds and a lot less interested in um, individual stocks. So I would suggest that uh, rather than them buying stocks in individual companies, you know, that they they are about to award a government contract to, they probably ring the uh, the manager themselves and say jump on uh, AstraZeneca or jump on Glaxo. So, yeah, I think I'm I'm definitely in favour of more transparency at government. I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be, especially when you're in a, uh, a position where you can influence the outcomes. You should absolutely have to be transparent on, you know, whatever you're doing on the side, if you're doing anything at all. Um, I think that would that that's a given for me. So, yeah, I would totally be in favour of, uh, of it. And, yeah, thanks for the question, Plus. I think it's a really interestingly worded uh, bit of policy making for what it's worth. I mean, so the way Plus put hmm. the question, um, uh, he or, or she, I suppose, um, acts as though this is about owning stocks at all. Um, it's not about owning stocks at all. It's about buying and selling in certain ways. And that's kind of important here because I would have thought that uh, a policy that was set up to prevent... Um, policymakers from owning stocks at all was going to be straightforwardly bad because i mean you want your kind of policymakers to do things for at least businesses in your country that are constructive for them i mean you don't necessarily want them to be entirely pro-business at the expense of uh, labor and so on but you do want them to be at least incentivized to make the uk the us wherever it is a reasonably attractive place to do business to be mindful of the fact that this kind of thing drives the economy um, and uh, them being incentivized by that, by allowing them to own stocks. I mean, if you prevent them from owning stocks, uh, you have to allow them to own something. Uh, if you prevent them from owning stocks and bonds and maybe commodities as well or something, they're going to own cash. And that would incentivize them to produce a bunch of cash friendly uh, policies, which would presumably be things like really high rates, which would depress stock prices all over the place. Uh, and then once they're out of power and resign from their jobs, they can just go and buy a load of cheap equities, I guess. Yeah, and that runs really nicely into the the recent thoughts around the billionaire wealth tax, doesn't it? I think that's got mm. the exact same problems, is that if you target a specific amount, a specific bunch of people, um, and you ask them to uh, pay tax on their unra unrealized gains, all that's going to do is hurt the rest of the investing community, because the thing about unrealized gains in the billionaire um is that they don't have that level of cash to to pay off um, what they're gaining. The vast majority of it is, is like we're told to be um, invested. So um, if Elon Musk has a billion dollar, two billion, five billion, ten billion dollar tax bill coming in on his unrealized Tesla shares, now he's going to have to sell some Tesla shares. And you know what ten billion dollars of sales is going to do to the Tesla price? It'll it'll move the market cap down by more than ten billion. I can tell you that it will. Uh, um, which is which is obviously always the problem with people's net worth is that it's very almost impossible to realise net worth, um, you know, because those kind of moves would um, would completely destroy the market. So I watched um, Aswas um, video, Demodoran's video on this, and I think you have as well, Steve. You um, picked some interesting points out of it. Do you want to go through? Uh, I should come clear on this. I I saw the kind of Cliff Notes version. I saw the interview with CNBC. Right. I haven't sat through the whole thing yet. Uh, but the murderer makes a point that this is unlikely to be a particularly effective uh, bit of legislation uh, at targeting billionaires, partly because billionaires are really hard to target, for what it's worth. Um, they tend to be fairly mobile. Uh, they tend to be um, able to get away from places that are kind of tax competent. And that's one thing that you might think favourably of on the UK budget, actually, for what it's worth. So there's a lot of relief for uh, tax relief for businesses coming down that have already been reasonably well helped. Um, it's a, a generous kind of budget and no doubt the kind of taxes will come is the the idea from Rishi Sunak but he is attentive I think to, uh, in the thought that in the wake of Brexit Britain needs to be if it wants to have a kind of thriving economy it needs to be attractive as a place to do business and one way you make yourself attractive as a place to do business is by uh, not targeting everybody with taxes all over the place I mean there's other problems with the way that the US policy is designed and stuff like uh, targeting Billionaires who uh, have made their money rather than acquiring it. So it wouldn't count, as I understand it, the way that's worded. Uh, you wouldn't be liable for unrealized gains that you inherit. You would be liable for the ones that you make, which seems kind of mad. It seems entirely the wrong way around to me. Uh, it's a way of disincentivizing people from making money. And there's an argument that says, look, if you inherit it and it wasn't your doing, then maybe you should pay tax on it. Um, that argument has some merit. I think it might be kind of limited in a certain way. But um, I 
do think this tax policy is kind of really weirdly uh, written and the murderer does a good job of exposing kind of why. Yeah, and the, the main point that he raises beyond the, pa- the fact that he thinks it's pretty much just sort of like signalling to your audience is that um, the these taxes have been tried before and they very rarely raise anywhere near the amount of money that they're projected to do so and thus become almost a drag on the, the tax collection because of the amount of money you have to spend trying to collect them. So, um, yeah, I think I feel like that the very similar sort of um, um, things. I think transparency is always great. Um, back going back to our original hmm. point, but I think um, a billionaire wealth tax is is a bad idea, probably. But I think you know a bit more transparency in in government. That's a pretty good idea. There's pretty good transparency, of course, at kind of corporate level, uh, particularly in the states. I mean, uh, you and I both pay, I guess, a fairly healthy attention to what's going on on the insider action um, at the companies that we own. Uh, the first time I came across this kind of idea actually was you pointing out insider selling at Illumina um, to me, which mm. is a company I owned at the time. That turned out to not be anything particularly major, but it is always interesting seeing unscheduled sales and scheduled buys. It's not always an absolute tell on these sorts of things, especially selling, um, especially even selling when it's um, off schedule uh, for letting go of options and so on. But uh, there's always interesting stuff to be had around insider action. Um, how do you think about this kind of thing, Steve? Uh, it's definitely something I look at, but it's not something I'm always overly bothered about because a lot of my companies tend to be very heavy on the stock-based compensation because they don't want to be too heavy on the salary. That's one of the ways they attract good staff. Um, insider selling to me has just become one of those things that people kind of do to get their, generate the kind of salary that they would expect in the, in the positions that they hold. So I guess it's a lot more apparent to you because if you're looking at a company that you think is really well valued and you see that they're, they're shedding shares left, right and centre, then especially the, the management, then that's obviously a, a, a really big worry for you. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting thing. It's definitely on those checklists of things that you've just got to quickly keep an eye on. You know, shares going up, shares getting sold. It's in the same kind of bracket. But yeah, um, my thoughts are generally, it's less important to me, but I fully understand the value as a as a sort of holistic view of, of, of companies. Yeah, so there's a couple of interesting things that I think about on these sorts of things. One is, you're absolutely right. I mean, the kind of companies that you have that are heavy on stock-based compensation, I mean, realistically, their employees, uh, their directors even, are never going to buy their shares. Why would you? You get given so many of them, you're trying to work out what to do with the things. Uh, mm. and that's true actually pretty much at any company. It's more exaggerated than the kind that you're talking about. But in general, if you work at a company, it really doesn't actually matter which company it is, but if you get part of your salary and shares... You should sell them and buy something else. Uh, even if you think Amazon is the greatest company in the world and you get shares in Amazon as part of your pay, it would be an unwise thing to just keep all of your portfolio on Amazon because it gets given to you and maybe given to you at a discount. By all means, sell it and go and buy something else, anything else, right? Um, even mm. if you think you have a really strong company. So you would expect most places to be, on balance, sellers of their own stocks. But that does make it interesting when people buy them. Uh, and it also makes it interesting when people sell things when they're not scheduled to. So in the States, most um, companies have scheduled plans for saying, look, I'm going to sell this many shares at this time, distant point in the future, regardless of what the stock price is. And this is a way of insider selling, not moving markets all over the place, because people can say, look, it's been the case for a year or so that I was going to sell these things this day. It's not because I think something suddenly bad has happened to the company. It's not because I think the stock price is too high. This was always going to happen. It's just also happening now, uh, basically. It gets interesting when you see um, companies selling their shares and it's not scheduled like that. So a really interesting example when the kind of race for the COVID vaccine was on was Moderna. Their share price shot up um, and they uh, had an issuance to raise some money. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Uh, When your share price is high, you sell some shares, but their directors were chucking in shares with them as well. Uh, which is kind of giving off an idea of they don't think they're going to be the people to sort out the COVID vaccine stuff. Uh, and they were wrong. Uh, they have a perfectly good COVID vaccine. Their share prices are much higher than they were selling them at. It makes you wonder about the kind of directors that sell those things. Um, so off schedule selling is sometimes a bit of a tell, but it can happen for a number of reasons. And sometimes it's not always the right thing to do, even from the insiders. Yeah, it's interesting that really, isn't it? Because that shows you really that at that point in time, Moderna didn't have much faith in its staff to deliver the um, deliver the vaccine. So yeah, that 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 would be a reason for you to uh, 
to well to to join them in selling out. And uh, how bad of a move would that have been today? It must be up. Uh, is it what must be three or four folds since then? Is it? It's yeah, uh, it's ridiculously up. It's been one of the yeah, been one of the absolute performers of the uh, of well of the last two years, and deservedly so. Really, come from from nowhere to to everywhere. So. Um, but I'm surprised nobody tried to take it out on the way up, which was always something interesting to me. I always wondered why um, you, would, you would assume that developing a vaccine from scratch or buying one that's very, very close is... Um, but then I suppose everybody had a vaccine that was very, very close because it was a quite widely dis um, distributed vaccine, wasn't it? Because it was, uh, it, most of them were based off a, an old vaccine, from my understanding, my limited understanding of vaccines. Yeah, I'm limited here as um, well. But I don't, Moderna don't look like a bookie's favourite uh, to me on this kind of thing. They, of course, hadn't really mm. brought any kind of vaccine to market beforehand. Uh, insiders are selling. Um, they're using a technology, I think, that is one that still remains to be proven at the time. So they did superbly well, uh, right? All of this speaks to the the credit of their workers and staff and people working on that vaccine. It does mean that I, uh, I think maybe in that kind of situation, it's hard to know where to look uh, for an acquisition on that sort of thing. Everyone's busy working on this kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Insider buying is an always interesting thing, I guess. I mean, we talked about insider selling. Sometimes it's a tell, sometimes it's not. Uh, I think it's Peter Lynch who says, look, people sell their own company shares for any number of reasons. They only ever buy them for one reason, uh, and that's because they think things are going well. So sometimes when you see a nice insider buy, um, there's an interesting sign there. I saw an insider buy on Mercado Libre uh, not so hmm. long ago, which interested me and caught my eye because I always think of Mercado Libre as a stock that's quite hard to value, probably expensive, don't know whether it's got the growth to match that. Uh, expensiveness mm. um, uh, but seeing an insider buying that has got me looking at that again very carefully uh, the website I use this by the way is Inside Arbitrage there are other ones that you can look at um, to see what's going on in various places but insider buying is unlikely in the kind of stuff that you know best I hear guess here Steve um, yes and no really it is interesting it's again it's just one of those little things that you look you're looking for on a list of things to check off isn't it is that if you um, if you think something's um, undervalued and um, and you'd like to purchase it one of the best things you can do is uh, look at you know the the CEO and also think that he thinks it's undervalued as well um, because he, he knows best, I suppose. He's probably just come out of the war room meeting and, you know, and what have you. But Mercado Libre is an interesting one. It's, um, it's something that I also think is quite expensive. But um, And it has a lot of tailwinds and it also has a lot of headwinds. So it's kind of, you, you've, you've just got to try and uh, figure out permanently um, how you feel like it will develop as a as a company it, it wants to be a bit more like amazon everybody tells you it's a bit more like ebay um you remember ebay's cardinal sin was spinning out paypal it's probably been the worst move by a business ever um mercado libre is very happy to hold on to its paypal um which is called mercado pay mm -hmm. um so you know there's potential for that company to to grow and grow and grow but you know, you're worried that WhatsApp are coming on. WhatsApp want to do payments in that area. There's C Limited now that's moved into that area, and C Limited wants to do payments. And um, you've got to worry about your ad yens and your visas and your Mastercards and anybody else who just fancies uh, cutting uh, Mercado Libre out of it. Although I don't really see it. They're they're more of enablers for those networks rather than um, takers. Mm. But really interesting times for Mercado Libre. I feel like the um, the brave amongst us probably could still do really really well off buying the stock and closing your eyes and looking at it in 20 years' time. It's an interesting one. I always think of Mercado Libre as a how far has it got left to go kind of thing. It's got a pretty big market cap for for what it is, mm. I think. But, um, you know, I would have said this several billion ago. Um, this is kind of not an obvious one with room to run. But we were talking when we were recording yeah, the weekend podcast of the fangs have done all right especially google uh i mean if you thought that the law of large numbers has to weigh on things and you think look once you get to a certain size it becomes basically too difficult to move the needle uh google's got news for you um it's doing very well mm -hmm. even at an enormous size it's still growing like an absolute weed so the number by itself i guess shouldn't put you off i just had a quick look Mercado libra 70 billion um c limited is just under 200 billion so Ooh, that's bigger than I thought from C uh, Limited. <laughs> so it's got, yeah. So it's got, you know, even if you think it could just be as big as C, that's a three X from now. Um, 
Very interesting. But yeah, just onto your Google point. It always makes me laugh because I, I'm a sort of a, a watcher of everything money, although I seem to do it through gritted teeth and gritted eyes sometimes. Um, but uh, it always makes me laugh because they absolutely and utterly tell you that there's no way that a company of this size, uh, of X size, can grow at 40%. And Google just said a massive fuck you. Yeah. Um, Tesla's got a massive market cap as well, and that really needs to grow quite fast. So. Hmm. I, I wonder about how seriously we should take that sort of thing. But maybe that's one for another day. Hmm. Anyway, uh, thanks for your question, Plus. That was really interesting. Um, if, like Plus Aerobic, you have a question you'd like to ask us, please do pop it in the comments. We always love reading them. We try to work our way through as many as we can. We've got them kind of organized into a queue at the moment, but we'd really be interested in hearing some more. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thanks to Steve for being here. Please do leave us a review on YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Audible, wherever you get your podcasting from. Um, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks very much, everyone. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. The sucker's going up. <laughs>